You're welcome to this morning's Signpost webinar. I'm Mark Gibson, and I'm head of the Chagask, uh, Chagask uh, Outreach and Innovation Department. This series is brought to you by Chagask in collaboration with Dairy Sustainability Ireland, the National Rural Network, and Food Drink Ireland Skillnet. And I'm also joined by Porik Foley in Johnstown Castle, who's going to be helping us with questions later on. Good morning, Porik. Good morning, Mark. Um, so this week we are celebrating Bioeconomy Ireland Week, which is an annual week-long event held each October to highlight and raise awareness of Ireland's rapidly growing bioeconomy. So what is the bioeconomy, some of you might be asking? Well, the bioeconomy is the part of the economy which preserves nature and uses renewable biological resources from agriculture, forestry, marine and organic waste systems uh, to produce food feed bio-based materials, chemicals and energy, and while reducing waste, all in support of achieving a sustainable, circular and climate neutral society. And today we'll be discussing a new innovative project called Bio Refinery Gloss, and we'll also be discussing the potential of the bioeconomy to transform grassland agriculture in Ireland. And to tell us more about the project, I'm delighted to be joined by James Gaffey, who is Director of Circular Bioeconomy Research Group at the Munster Technological University, and Dr. Bridget Lynch, who is a Senior Research Officer with the Environment and Soils and Land Use Programme with Chagisk, and Professor Johan Sanders, who is former professor in bio-based economy at Wageningen University in the Netherlands. Good morning, everybody. Morning, Mark. Morning. Morning, everybody. Very welcome to the Signpost web webinar. And uh, perhaps, Johan, if I could start with you and maybe just to introduce yourself and uh, maybe tell us where you're coming from this morning. Well, I, I live in, the, in Groningen, in the northern part of, uh, of the Netherlands. And I keep myself busy with bio-based economy projects like grass biorefinery, which I will uh, comment on today. Great, thank you. And looking forward to your presentation later, uh, Johan. And um, James, if you could uh, tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing down in MTU. Yeah, so um, I co-lead a, a research group in bioeconomy. We're about uh, just over 15 researchers working on dif different research and innovation actions all related to the bioeconomy. We're also involved in the education side. We co-deliver Ireland's first uh, master's program in bioeconomy alongside Chagask and University College Dublin. And uh, I suppose I've been based in MTU and formerly IT Tralee for the last five years and have worked for seven years in industry before uh, joining uh, academia on the bioeconomy side. Thanks, James. And Bridget, um, you're, not, you're not too far away from us in Chagask, you're down in Johnstown Castle. Can you tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing there? Yeah, so um, I joined Chagas in January of this year. Um, I'm working as an agronomist, um, predominantly in the agriculture catchments programme, um, but also um, working in, in other projects in the environment, soils and land use department. Prior to that, I was associate professor of grass and forage science in UCD, and that's where I was involved in the biorefinery glass project. And I continued to work with James and Johan through the Farm Zero Z um, project, which we presented last week, and um, other initiatives. Thanks, Bridget. Um, so we're going to have three separate presentations this morning, all around 10 minutes long. And uh, so if I could ask uh, James, uh, you're going to kick off the presentations for us, if you could share your screen with us. And uh, just while you're doing that, James, we just want to remind everybody that there is a Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Please do send us your questions. Uh, at any stage, and uh, we'll endeavour to, to answer as many of those at the end of the presentation. And today's uh, webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Chagask uh, website afterwards, along with the presentation. And you can also tune into the, the uh, Signpost webinar, or sorry, um, the Signpost podcast, um, if you are uh, not able to get to a screen. And uh, just to give a special shout out to Patrick Barrett, who is in the Department of Agriculture, uh, Patrick has been uh, driving the, the whole bioeconomy agenda within the Department of Agriculture. And uh, thanks to, to Patrick, we have all of these uh, fine presenters today. So, uh, James, we can see your screen fine there. Perfect. Um, if you want to maximize it there, That's and great. Uh, we'll let you, uh, you can continue there. Thanks, Mark. Morning, everyone. Um, so, I'm going to talk and introduce the Biorefinery Gloss Project. Um, 
It's one of the EIP Agri projects and it's funded by the Department of the Ag Agriculture, Food and the Marine. And we're a collaboration between Munster Technological University, uh, working with Carberry on the dairy farmer side, Barry Rowe on the pig farmer side, Grassa, who are represented here today by Johan, and uh, UCD, whose work on the project will be represented by Bridget. So uh, in the project, we demonstrated it's a bioeconomy project. So there is a focus uh, on uh, touching into those areas that Mark mentioned. It's focused on biological resources and trying to uh, increase the sustainability of those, but also to look at what new products and particularly sustainable products we could produce from our biological resources. And in our project, we focused on demonstrating a small scale grass biorefinery. Um, we did this with uh, farmers in the four West Cork co-ops as part of the Carberry Group. It's a mobile unit, it's a two tonne per hour prototype, and we demonstrated that on five different farms. The purpose of that was on one hand to familiarise farmers with the operations involved in a bioeconomy process, specifically this grass biorefinery process, uh, um, and also to involve them in the different logistical aspects of that and improve visibility of the bioeconomy and this particular system among the farming community. And on the other side, to try and produce enough volume of products that we could actually test and see how the products performed and did this have a realistic chance of being an opportunity for diversification into the bioeconomy. So within the process, we take in fresh grass. The grass is washed at the start and it's uh, mechanically pressed using an extruder to separate out about 35%, uh, 40% of the protein into a pressed juice, uh, which can be further processed. And the remaining protein remains in fiber, dry fiber fraction, which can be ensiled and can be used as a ruminant feed. Uh, from the pressed juice, then we can apply heat treatment to concentrate the protein, which can be separated using a solid liquid separation, uh, can be dried and can be used as potentially as a, a feed for monogastrics. Uh, the residual stream that's left, we call a grass whey, which can be processed using a membrane separation technology to extract out short chain sugars, uh, fructooligosaccharides, which can be used in the feed additive or food uh, nutraceutical markets. And the final stream, which is a high liquid stream, can be further concentrated to produce a fertilizer or can be used directly as a substrate to produce uh, biogas through anaerobic digestion. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the trial work that we did on the different products that we produced. Um, first of all, the, the first product we looked at was press cake, uh, which we looked at as a replacement for silage in dairy cows. Uh, and Bridget is going to focus her presentation in on this in more detail, so I'm not going to talk too much, but I, I will say that we, we got very good results, even though the overall uh, protein level that was in the press kit wa was lower than the silage. Uh, and because we got really nice results, it kind of opens the door to what we can get from this fraction here, the green juice fraction, when we extract further products, and that's what I'm going to focus in on. So um, as I said, we were able to extract a protein concentrate uh, from the grass juice, and we were able to trial it as an additive in pig feed diets to replace soybean and other ingredients. Uh, we did this uh, through a farm down in Cork uh, owned by Cottle O'Donovan, uh, a pig farm, and we tested it uh, over uh, a 55, uh, a 31 day period with 55 uh, weaners, nine week old, uh, in each batch and try to include about 15% of the grass protein concentrate into a treatment diet and compared it to a traditional uh, weaner diet for weaners of that age. So just if you look at the crude protein, it's about 34%. The crude fiber is about 6%. Uh, we integrated this into the diet and we were able to take out about 30% of the soybean meal in the diet, in the traditional diet, about 25% of barley and about 8% of the wheat. Uh, we ran the trial and we looked at the daily feed intake. And as you'd expect for weaners of that size, they both, they, they, the daily feed intake in both uh, samples increased uh, week on week. But by the time we got to the end of the trial and the end of the period, we actually had an increase in daily feed intake in the case of the treatment diet, which is the diet which included our grass protein concentrate. We had a similar level of uh, feed conversion ratio between the two samples. And in relation to the average daily gain, during the first week, we had a bit of a lag in the treatment diet um, because the pigs were most likely 
uh, acclimatizing onto the new grass protein diet. And as uh, the trial progressed, that started to improve week on week. And by the time we got to the end of the trial, uh, we actually had an increase in uh, average daily gain comparing the treatment diet with the control diet. Uh, so these are preliminary results. We've covered them in a publication, which I've included in the, in the slide. Uh, the preliminary results, and we'll probably need uh, further trials to, to um, further validate this, but uh, it is at least initially a very positive indication of the potential of the protein. So just to look at the residual streams that are left, because we've extracted the press cake, extracted the protein, we then have the whey stream, uh, which we can actually further valorize and extract this yellow material here, which is short chain fructooligosaccharides, which can be a, a prebiotic. So I guess what's, what's a prebiotic? So we know what probiotics are. They're these, uh, what we call good gut, gut bacteria that can uh, grow in the intestines and can have uh, improved gastrointestinal functionality and can have a lot of uh, added uh, effects, including uh, removal of pathogens and alleviating and mitigating against uh, different uh, conditions. Uh, so fructooligosaccharides are, are one form of prebiotics, and prebiotics are the food that probiotics thrive on, that probiotics grow on. Uh, so they can come from multiple sources, uh, fructooligosaccharides, they can come from shikari, from artichoke and other plants, uh, but there is the potential to extract these FOS from grass as well. So using a membrane separation technology from the residual stream, we were able to separate about 10 grams for every liter of whey, of what we call a, a FOS concentrate or a fructooligosaccharide concentrate. And about half of this was in the form of uh, actual uh, short chain FOS sugars. So to assess the potential of the FOS sugars, we did some lab scale work using a culture called, uh, a, a technique called cell culture, uh, where we use the FOS to grow um, the, the probiotic bacteria to understand the potential for increasing cell, cell density as a result of the, the addition of the FOSS sugar. And we were able to compare these with other samples of FOSS, including uh, commercial FOSS on the market, as well as inulin, which is often seen as the gold standard uh, for prebiotics. And uh, overall, we had very positive results across uh, all of the uh, probiotic bacteria. In particular, we had a very good uh, comparison between the grass-based FOSS and the commercial FOSS. And while it's an early stage work, it, it does give an indication that there may be possible to get this value-added product from grass in the future. Um, then the residual stream that was left, we wanted to assess the potential of this to use as a substrate for anaerobic digestion, because we hear a lot in Ireland about the potential for grass to gas and to develop um, biomethane as an alternative use for grassland. So what we're trying to assess within the project as well is to understand what, to what extent we could extract uh, some value added products like protein, like FOS, like press cake, and still have some residual streams that could be used for the production of biogas or biomethane. So we did some work with our industry partner, Salignus Analytical on a lab scale to look at the potential of the side streams to be used for the production of anaerobic digestion. What we found was that overall on a volatile solids basis and dry matter basis, we had a very uh, good level of production comparable with silage for both the biogas and biomethane. It's quite a bit lower when we look at the fresh weight, which you would expect because of the products that we've pressed out of the, uh, of, of the grass, uh, but it had a positive uh, from the point of view of retention time, it was a very easily digestible uh, material. We had about 80% of the uh, biogas produced within the first five days, which is significantly shorter. So we think it could be implemented and upscaled without too much technical difficulty. Uh, and it does have the potential if combined with CHP, combined heat and power to meet uh, most of the energy demands of the biorefinery, which would be positive from the sustainability point of view as well. So those are the main streams that we looked at. Um, and Bridget is gonna go into the press cake. Um, but before I finish, I just want to mention the farmers who uh, we couldn't have done this project without. Uh, so the dairy farmers who participated, Vanessa, Kevin, Michael, Michael, Tim and Shane, and Cahill and Declan who participated on the pig feed trials. And we couldn't have done this without them. And I don't think we can have a bioeconomy without the participation of farmers because it depends on the production of biological raw materials. 
Um, so if we're to have a sustainable, long lasting bioeconomy going into the future, uh, we need to think about how farmers are going to be part of that. And I think one of the focuses of the Biorefiner Gloss project was to really try as much as possible to put the farmers front and center, improve farmer knowledge of this. Uh, but going forward, I do think it's important that we uh, make sure that these new business models that are being developed, if they're to be sustainable, they need to have farmers at the core. Um, so a big shout out to all of our farmers. And that's all from me. And I'm passing back to you, Mark. Thanks, James. Um, so we're going to move swiftly on to Bridget's presentation. So Bridget is going to uh, present now. So um, hi, Bridget. Yeah. So looking forward to having a good discussion afterwards. So do send us your questions using the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen and uh, we can see your screen now, okay. Uh, we can see presenter mode, I think. So display settings, yeah, and, and just do swap, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, okay, um, so Thank you, James, and I'm going to present a dairy feeding trial that was completed with the press cake on behalf of the team at UCD Lines Farm, where the work was conducted. And a special thanks to the master student on the project, Eleonora Sierra, um, who completed the work. So I'm going to start off with the baseline forages that were used in the feeding trial. Um, so James explained how the press cake was produced. Um, and it's important to note that the press cake um, was produced between the 1st of July and the 7th of August 2019. And the farmers had set aside um, paddocks for the biorefinery um, and the machine was a little later getting um, to the farms than planned. And so the, the standing crop was more mature than we would have liked. We compared the press cake to a first cut grass silage that was produced in Lyons Farm and um, that was mown on the 14th of May, had a 24 hour wilt and so had, you know, a, as good a conditions as you would plan for for first cut silage. So that's important to note when we look at the chemical composition of the feedstuffs that we used. So in combination with the maturity differences in the standing crop and the, the refinery process, the press cake had a higher dry matter percentage, a lower crude protein, um, higher fiber fractions. So those of you not familiar with chemical composition of feedstuffs, the NDF is neutral detergent fiber and the ADF is acid detergent fiber and just tells us the fiber fractions that are in the feedstuffs. Um, and another one to note is a slightly lower phosphorus content in the press cake compared to the first cut grass silage. So we took those um, forages and we formulated two experimental treatments um, to work with, um, with lactating dairy cows. So our control or our grass silage treatment um, consisted of 14 kilos of the first cut grass silage, um, 7.2 kilos of concentrate on a dry matter basis, and there was also um, 440 grams of soya in the diet as well. The press cake treatment had five kilos of grass silage and there was a direct substitute of nine kilos of press cake for nine kilos of grass silage. Um, same level of standard concentrate um, and then the soybean meal was added into both diets to make sure that we met the protein requirements for the cows for the stage of lactation and what they were producing at the start of the trial. Um, and these were fed in a partial mixed ration. So the grass silage, press cake, half of the um, concentrate, which was an 18% dairy ration, um, and the soybean meal were fed in the partial mix, mixed ration, and then the cows received the other half of their concentrate in the parlor at um, morning and evening milking. So the cows that we used, so we selected 30 autumn calving um, Holstein Friesian dairy cows from the commercial herd at Lyons Farm, and there were 70 days in milk. Uh, at the start of the trial, producing 31 kilos per day um, at 4.3 and 3.7% fat and protein, respectively. Um, they had two weeks, essentially, to adapt um, to the feed um, treatments. And then we measured, or the, the parameters that I'm going to present on were measured over a 63-day period. Um, and those measurements included uh, dry matter intake, milk production and composition, rumen fermentation parameters like pH, ammonia and volatile fatty acids. 
uh, metabolic status, um, and we also completed a nitrogen and phosphorus balance as well. So this is the chemical composition of what the animals actually consume through the dietary treatments. Um, so again, just the press cake remained to have a higher dry matter percentage compared to the grass silage, a lower protein, um, higher fiber fraction, um, and also a slightly lower phosphorus content. And it's just important to note those as I go through the, the results. So just starting with intake. Um, so the cows at the press cake, um, no problem. Uh, they did have a lower partial mixed ration intake and total intake compared to the grass silage groups, um, as you see there, and that was significantly different. And because of that lower intake and also the lower protein content in the um, treatment and a slightly lower phosphorus content, they also had lower nitrogen intake and phosphorus intake. Um, there is no difference in feed deficiency, and feed deficiency in this context is energy correct milk divided by dry matter intake. So moving on to milk production and quality, and milk production is um, shown in the top half of this table, and milk quality is shown in the bottom half of the table. So um, we've no significant effect of treatment on milk yield, um, on protein kilos, and there is a tendency towards um, a reduction in milk solids production in the press cake group um, compared to the grass silage group. Um, and that is driven by a significant reduction in fat kilos produced per cow per day during, on average during the experimental um, period. Um, with regards to milk quality, um, there was no significant effect on fat or protein, but a numerical difference there on fat, which is probably driving that reduction um, in fat kilos produced per cow per day. Um, a reduction in milk urea um, in the press cake group compared to the um, grass silage group, um, and also a, a reduction in energy correct milk um, in the press cake group compared to the grass silage group. So other findings. Um, from the measurements that we took during the animal feeding study. So um, what I'm showing here, the arrows are press cake versus grass silage, and these were significant effects. Um, there was a reduction in rumen ammonia concentration of the um, protein or nitrogen that the animals consumed in the diet. There was more excreted in milk and feces, and there was no difference in urinary nitrogen. And that's important because urinary nitrogen is volatilized much, much more readily um, compared to fecal nitrogen. And we obviously want to see more of the nitrogen diverted into milk and feces. There was an overall reduction in nitrogen and phosphorus excretion, um, and there is an increase in nitrogen use efficiency in the press cake group compared to the grass silage group. So just moving on, Eleonora also completed um, an in vitro study with the rumen simulation techniques. So this is essentially a lab-based rumen. Um, so what we've got here is a, a number of vessels that, was, that represent individual rumens. Um, we collect rumen fluid um, from dairy cows and put it into the vessels. Um, and that essentially the rumen environment is simulated in the laboratory um, through a heated water bath. Um, we have saliva that's been pumped through to keep the rumen or the vessels buffered. Um, and these are fed um, every day with the feedstuffs or the experimental feedstuffs that we would have given the, the, the real cows, if you like, um, to simulate the, the same treatments and the same environment. Um, so from that, we can collect the overflow um, into the um, collection containers down here. Um, and it also enables us to collect gas that is produced from the um, rumens as well, or the vessels as well. Um, and just to credit Megan Bach who worked on the project for putting together that nice diagram. So we looked at the same two dietary treatments that I explained already. Um, and over the eight day experimental period, um, we we're able to collect um, or estimate apparent digestibility, pH in vitro fermentation parameters, in vitro total gas and methane production as well. So the findings from um, the Rusitec study, um, and these are trends towards, um, so they weren't significantly different, but they are interesting nonetheless. 
there was a reduction in apparent digestibility, um, a reduction in rumen ammonia concentration, which mimics what we saw in the um, cow trial, um, a reduction in total gas production, and also a reduction in methane production. So this reduction in apparent digestibility probably isn't entirely surprising given the fiber levels um, in the feedstuffs in the press cake compared to the grass salute. So to conclude, um, press cake has the potential to partially replace grass silage in the diet of early lactation uh, dairy cows. Um, and I think if we can target, um, you know, harvesting the feedstuff um, or the grass, um, just as it's about to head out at more vegetative stage, um, then I don't think you would see a difference in the performance of the animals. There was a reduction in nitrogen and phosphorus excretion and an increase in nitrogen use efficiency that shows the potential, I guess, um, for environmental mitigation um, through the use of press cake. And Johan is going to expand more on the nitrogen use efficiency and protein replacement. And I guess the next steps with regard to research would be to look at a higher quality standing crop and also look at the inclusion of um, grass clover swords and multi-species swords um, to improve feed quality, but also to reduce the nitrogen or chemical nitrogen that's used in the system, which will help the um, life cycle analysis further. Um, and Lawrence, as part of the Farm Series E project, um, Lawrence Shalhou is starting a trial with press cake, and he is going to be putting the cows um, through the green feeds. Um, and so there will be um, methane emission um, work um, coming in, in the next couple of months from the Farm Zero Seed project as a follow-up. That's it for me. Okay, thanks, Bridget. That uh, gives a very good assessment of the, the animal uh, digestibility side of things. A few questions coming through there on your, your presentation. We'll, we'll, co we'll come to those at the end. So uh, we now move to um, our final presentation, uh, which is uh, from Johan. And uh, Johan, I'll just send you a link there to start your video as well. Um, can you, yeah, that looks good. Uh, yes, I, I would like to start with uh, the bigger picture. Um, we use. Could, uh, sorry, Johan, to interrupt you. If you could maybe maximize your screen there, yeah. go to full slide presentation mode. We use uh, far too much uh, nitrogen to make our daily uh, protein, and we have too little land to do that. Two thirds of our agricultural land in the world is used for animal feed. And at the um, uh, efficiency level that we use nitrogen to make the 50 grams of protein that we eat per day, we need about seven kilograms of nitrogen uh, to get one kilogram in the protein. And with 10 billion people in 2050, we would need more than three times the amount that our uh, planet can cope with. These are the planetary boundaries. Uh, everybody is aware of the CO2 and the greenhouse gases, the biodiversity losses, but also the nitrogen already has overstepped the planetary boundaries. Protein could become uh, scarce in the world if we do not solve this problem. We will get a lot of biodiversity uh, loss. We will get um, misharvest after misharvest that could lead to hunger, that could lead to wars, and a lot of migration uh, from uh, people that do not have enough uh, protein. So we could um, use less uh, nitrogen in agriculture. We could uh, make more protein per hectare. Um, we should increase not only the use of the nitrogen, but also the protein that is uh, produced in agriculture, sometimes is lost in agriculture, we should use that. Um, and of course, uh, we should uh, reduce the amount of transportation that we require, and the farmer income uh, should, uh, should also be uh, higher. There are several solutions, main solutions. So shifting towards a more plant-based protein in our food uh, or growing feed crops, at least on land that is not suitable to grow uh, food crops because they are required for human food. Uh, enhancing the fertilization 
efficiency of crops using legumes, and those are plants that can fixate nitrogen from the air in a form that you can produce uh, proteins in the uh, plants. And of course, also recycle ammonia from manure digestates, because then you can better direct and control the use of the nitrogen, um, which is now not very easy in a manure. Um, biorefinery can help us uh, to have a higher uh, benefit of the proteins grown in plants. I will show you about that. And James already did. Uh, improve the digestibility and also the feed conversion. And what would be a good crop for choice? Of course, it's under our feet, grass, most common in the world and certainly also in, uh, in Ireland. And if you compare grass or grass clover, which is actually a legume, with other crops, for instance, like soybean, you see that the protein yield per hectare already is quite a lot better than, uh, than for soy. And also some essential amino acids, which is important for uh, monogastric uh, animals, uh, is also important. It's a perennial, so the whole year you can harvest the grass. Um, and uh, you could also use it in uh, arable um, uh, farming uh, as a perfect rotation crop. As James already has mentioned, we uh, can produce now uh, four different fractions uh, from starting from grass. One is the press cake, uh, which has an increased protein resistance, which is a benefit for uh, the feeding to, um, to ruminants, to cows. We make a protein concentrate, a dried protein concentrate, which has 55% dry matter and a better essential amino acid composition than soy. Um, so this has a higher value. We make the prebiotic that James already mentioned and uh, a mineral concentrate that can be used in uh, agriculture as a fertilizer. I show you now the process as it is in the Netherlands at four tons of fresh grass per hour. Here you see uh, the refiner that opens up the cells and you get the press cake uh, here in the end. And here below you see uh, the juice which is transported. Here we do a filtration step for the protein. Here we do uh, a coagulation by heating and then the protein becomes insoluble but still very wet, as you can see here, most is water. But down the line of this vacuum uh, press filter, you, it becomes more drier and drier. And here you see protein leaving at a concentration of 20% dry matter. And afterwards, it is dried in a separate uh, dryer. Um, I should go to, oh. When we look to the um, sustainability and compare grass protein with uh, soy meal protein, we use a lot less land. We have a lower emissions of ammonia and phosphorus. Uh, and also the uh, greenhouse gases are a lot lower when we compare to soy produced in uh, Brazil. As a consequence, um, we do not require any import of soy protein in the European Union anymore. Uh, if 25 uh, million of hectares, which is about a third of the grassland in Europe, an island could play an important role, um, could be uh, processed, as I indicate, uh, so that we compensate for the import of soy. It is uh, non-GMO, which uh, sometimes is regarded as an advantage. It will uh, increase the employability per million hectare with about 100,000 uh, FTE. And the production of grass, of course, can be done on marginal land. And Ireland could become a net exporter of protein products and prebiotics. When I look forward um, quite a bit, if we combine uh, different technologies, as I mentioned, to use legumes uh, in swords, we need a lot less uh, nitrogen fertilizers. The biorefinery will increase the protein efficiency um, and making about 50% more animal protein, 
uh, while the milk per hectare uh, stays at the same place. So all the 50% added is um, protein from pigs or poultry. And uh, we could strip about 50% of the ammonia in uh, manure digest states. And if we combine that, um, starting with uh, a efficiency use of nitrogen of 16%, uh, combining that with uh, all the different technologies that I mentioned, we could threefold increase it or a little bit lower if we don't combine all three uh, technologies. But this threefold uh, would make us that we uh, will stay within the planetary boundaries. Another outlook, uh, and some of you will recognize this uh, slide from uh, last week's signpost uh, event. Uh, we are now in an Irish project, Farm Zero Carbon project. We have a holistic approach. We see that we uh, do um, the carbon sequestration. We have the biorefinery. We have um, a biogas uh, production and a, a variety of other technologies, uh, electricity from wind, uh, in order to reduce the different types of um, CO2, CO2 emissions, animal emissions, uh, also from land. And hopefully it will result in the overall reduction of um, emissions of CO2, which is now a little bit more than one kilogram of CO2 per kilogram of uh, milk. And gradually, we hope to reach a zero emission uh, of CO2 in the end of this uh, project. Overall conclusion is that biorefining of grass will increase the animal protein production per hectare by about uh, 50%. Biorefinery of leaves can substitute all soy imported in the European Union and can make Ireland a net uh, protein exporter and biorefinery will lead to increased rural employability and increased agricultural incomes. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Johan. And uh, I mean, that really puts it into context, the, the importance of these types of projects, uh, uh, given the, the reliance of, of the EU on, on imported uh, protein. I, I was just looking at some figures there. I think uh, about 14 million tonnes of soybean is imported by the European Union annually. So which is a huge, huge uh, amount coming from, from outside of, of, of the, the, the block. Um, so um, we have some questions coming in here, but just before we get to those, um, maybe Johan, if you could stop sharing your screen for us. Oh yeah. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, we, we, we talked about that, that, that overall, uh, Obviously, this is this this science is, is that um, we would say you you've you've prototyped it so forth. What about the the economics of this? Um, has that been looked at? Um, and I'll maybe throw it out to whoever wants to 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 take that one because it is a question I imagine is that that's comes to mind for for people as to how scalable is this type of uh, technology. Yeah. Well, we uh, had this topic, of course, also in the uh, glass project that uh, James was referring, uh, also in combination with uh, biogas. That is a good combination because then uh, you make the energy that is required in the process yourself from renewable resources. And overall, it came to, uh, to a positive economic result. Uh, that's also the case in the Netherlands, where we now have four tons per hour, but we plan uh, next year to go to eight tons and probably also uh, to 16 tons. And that certainly gives you uh, a good payback uh, in the order of four years or something like that uh, of the capital that you require to, to do this. And of course, the labor and energy costs are all included. As I mentioned already in my presentation, we are not only isolating the proteins and the, and the fibers, etc., from the grass, but we are also upgrading them so that the market value of these products will increase. And uh, that will make us that it even can be done at smaller scales than eight, um, eight uh, tons per hour. 
but we think eight tons per hour is still in a country where there's a lot of grass. It's a few kilometers to the left, a few kilometers to the right to collect enough of your raw materials. James, if I could ask you in relation to the, I suppose, the overall involvement of farmers in these types of, of projects, initiatives, um, this is something that we have spoken, I think, even last year at last year's Bioeconomy Week about the the importance of farmers being involved in the 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 or having some ownership of this process, um, because uh, something like this could so easily, I suppose, be farmed out or up up, up the, the 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 value chain. Uh, has there been any thinking done around that in terms of you know the potential for cooperatives to form around these types of technologies? I think it's over the last few years, it's definitely come more under the spotlight from the policymakers' point of view. Um, there's an initiative at European level called Bio-Based Industry Joint Undertaking, which is working to help commercialize the bioeconomy, biorefineries across Europe, and really they're placing a greater emphasis on the need for a better integration of farmers within these large-scale demo projects that are going to get funded, because there's a significant amount of investment that's going to be required to roll this out. And for a business to operate over a 25, 30 year period, you're going to require farmers to be providing that feedstock all the way along, not for the first few years, and then something else comes along. So I think there is a growing realization that the models need to include farmers in, for example, as you said, a cooperative uh, way in order to help achieve this. I think that's what we've been trying to do to some degree within the project and with the grass model, as Johan said, um, because you have a very high moisture content material, you probably have a more local supply chain. And if you can get the value from the products, then uh, you have a smaller facility, you have potential for farmers to come in as potential shareholders in this because the capital expenditure from some of the larger scale facilities that we see across Europe uh, could be avoided. But as you said, there is still a risk that large industry runs away with all the opportunities. And I think it's important that that doesn't happen. And, and Bridget, from a, a, an animal feed perspective, how, how do you think that this type of technology will be received by the, the industry, uh, given the reliance on imported uh, protein sources? Yeah, I think there's a lot of interest in I suppose the idea of producing our own protein um, and you know there's a lot of work underway in protein crops um, you know peas lupins things like that um, but not everywhere can grow those um, so if we could produce a protein concentrate that can be used both in in monogastric and also ruminant diets from grassland which grows in 90 percent of our land area um, and that it can support um, a similar um, level of production um, compared to soya or the alternatives that we import at the minute, um, then I think that would be hugely welcome. I was uh, fascinated by the diagram you, you showed there. I was feeling sorry for the poor soul, whoever had to collect the saliva for uh, that, that experiment. Or was, was that something that was actually generated <laughs> artificially? No, the, the saliva is, is artificial, um, okay. but the rumen is real and, and they have to collect that um, and it's all under license. Yeah. Of course, of course. Yes, yes. Uh, Porik, some, some really interesting questions coming through there. Absolutely, Mark. Um, and, and plenty, plenty of them. Uh, Johan, just uh, out of curiosity, if I can ask a question myself, how do you see it working? So you said there, there are obviously a lot of uh, grass fields to the left and to the right of the plant. Um, would they be consistently producing grass just for your plant or would they be kind of just bringing in first cut silage and then getting back the pressed cake afterwards in wraps or lot, like logistically, how does it work? Are they just producing harvesting for the process? Well, the, the best, of course, economically speaking, is that you have 12 months a year, your raw material available. So in countries like yours itself, uh, at the warm Gulf Stream, you have a benefit over the Netherlands where we have cold winters and uh, three months we do not have grass. But uh, in that period, uh, we want to um, process vegetable residues, for instance. Um, and we also look into other countries. In France, we can uh, produce the whole year around. Uh, not only grass, 
um, next week I will go to Uganda, where they have a lot of uh, legumes, uh, other plants than grass. And they are very good for uh, producing the protein because they, they start with a higher protein level in the leaves. Um, so there's a, a variety of raw materials, but of course, economics tell us 12 months a year uh, gives, uh, gives a better return. There's quite a few questions on the economics of it and what the cost would be for a commercial system. Even if you mentioned 16 tons, but even at the current four tons per hour or eight tons per hour, what an estimate approximately what would it cost to set up a system like that? And when would it be commercially available? Yeah, we expect uh, that the eight tons per hour will cost uh, between one and a half and two million euros. So quite a bit, but it is three times a potato harvester, I would say. Um, so it's quite a bit. The economics um, economy of scale will tell us that at 16, it will be uh, somewhat better, of course. Okay, okay. Bridget, the DMD of the press cake, uh, just a question on that and what it was. Yeah, so we analyzed dry matter digestibility um, by calculation in the laboratory, and I wasn't happy with the results. I've actually just queried them. Um, so Eleanor is going to look at that again, but through the Rustic um, study, the, the apparent digestibility of the grass silage treatment versus the press cake treatment. So with, with all the feedstuffs in it, there was a 12% difference. So press cake treatment was 12% lower um, in apparent digestibility. Did you look at the volatile fatty acids in what you were working with? Um, or was there any difference in vitro or in vivo? Yeah, so that's a good question. Just for maybe the, those unfamiliar, volatile fatty acids are a major end product of the um, digestion of carbohydrates in the rumen. And so are, you know, a logical thing to measure to get all the pieces of the puzzle together to explain, um, I suppose, the, the milk production and, and what's happening in the rumen. Um, so we did measure those and they've just been analysed in the lab and, and Norris just got, back, got them back this week. Um, it was delayed because of just access to the lab with COVID. Um, so we have those and they are the final measurement um, before we, we submit a paper or publish on this work. James, does it have to be fresh grass that you use um, or, or can you use silage? Just like obviously Johan mentioned that you can work with uh, different vegetable crops and so forth. But from an Irish perspective, you have a tight window for harvesting. Yeah, so it's ideally fresh grass part, but within we, you can't run a, a system on six months of fresh grass a year. So we, we, when we looked at the economic model, we based it on 280 days and we had 180 days of fresh grass and uh, 100 days of, of silage. We took into account in the mass balance that we, we did some initial processing at grasses labs. The, the, the quality of the products isn't as good when we look at silage, the, the protein con, uh, concentration is lower, the, the FOSS production is lower, uh, so we took that into account in the economics, so it's possible, but it will, it, 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 and, and it needs to, we need to have that, that extra feedstock, but it isn't as, as profitable as the six months where we have fresh uh, grass or, or other materials, sugar beet leaves or other materials that could be available. Johan, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that. No, that, that is uh, the case. And uh, the loss in the protein content in the protein product can be recovered in the FOS uh, uh, concentrate. Uh, even while the FOS is uh, somewhat lower, uh, you will collect all the other peptides from the protein in that membrane fraction. We just have a question in relation to you mentioned about the planetary boundaries, Johan, in your, your presentation. Um, have you looked at the environmental, or the, the overall environmental uh, impact of, of taking, say, one kilogram of press cake uh, and how energy intensive is, is the biorefining process? So I suppose maybe expanding that, and I know you have mentioned in the presentation, but thinking of the, the, those wider impacts. Yeah, well, the process uh, certainly takes uh, quite a lot of energy at the moment. That is diesel, um, but we want to use um, renewable energy, which can be done like the wind or uh, solar energy. 
With solar panels, we need about 5% of the grassland that is being processed to raise the, the energy, enough energy for the whole process. And if we have biogas uh, in place, uh, we can cover about two thirds of the biogas input from the leftovers from the grass process. So that is then uh, coupled in each other. The overall picture uh, is what I have shown to you. 75 reduction percent reduction in greenhouse gases uh, as compared to soy from uh, Brazil, including all the deforestation. If we compare it with soy from the United States, um, it is, um, well, about 40% better. So still uh, quite considerable. Uh, the other points not often taken into account, land use. Um, as I showed, 33% lower land is uh, required and land of marginal quality that you cannot use for arable crops and you should appreciate that in Ireland um, and in other countries, of course, as well. And uh, well, the, the output of um, nitrogen and phosphorus is also considerably lower. And that is important to stay within the limits of this planet. Uh, Bridget, there's a question coming in there around uh, whether it would justify pressing a farm's full winter feed supply or would you treat it as being the best route for what's now going into surplus bales? Um, yeah, so that's kind of a question if, if you're happy to take that one. Yeah, I suppose I, I kind of see this fitting into a farm system as being something for a fragmented farm where you have outside land blocks and you could use maybe, you know, a couple of hectares that are away from the yard um, for this and maybe target, you know, the type of grass species that are in it and the, the, the timing of cutting for that. Um, I suppose if you're looking at surplus bales, it, it would depend on how it's set up, maybe in a co-op system in the area um, and the supply or what kind of contract you would have with the buyer refinery. You know, if it's surplus bales, it's a bit ad hoc and it's very much open to grass growth in a particular year. Um, the winter feed stuff, I think we would need to run another trial on a higher quality standing crop before we could be sure that the press cake could fully substitute for grass silage for the winter period. We have a, a, a question here from uh, one of our viewers just, just asking about us to talk about vegetable protein for food. Um, I guess this, this, this project is, is, uh, has been developed in the context that the, the, there will be livestock production for the foreseeable future and that this is part of that that uh, process of, of reducing the environmental impact of livestock, livestock pr production. Um, I mean, Johan, we, we, we know that there are, you know, a lot of developing countries now are looking to uh, increase the amount of, of meat in their diets. And, uh, you know, that this is something that we, we can't uh, necessarily control centrally or at a, at a global level, but we do need to come up with these bottom-up type approaches that, that you're, you're presenting. Maybe you'd like to comment on that any further? Yeah, I'm, I'm just writing a, a publication at the moment. Also for the Netherlands, it's an issue. But I think we should reduce our animal protein in our diet. But it doesn't say that we need to reduce the animal protein production in our country. And the same could hold for you. We should export more of our pro, uh, animal products to other countries because in our countries you cannot produce a lot of arable crops on that same land. What we might do is isolate the protein from the grass or better from legumes and uh, technically it can be done. We did it and we can make even white protein so that people um, are tending to eat it uh, without getting green teas, things like that. Uh, it can be done and it will be done in the future, but you have to get permission from the European Union for that. And that takes a lot of time and money. And James, where do you see the next stages of this project going? Well, 
I think Denmark is, is one of the leaders in this space at the moment. They currently have three demonstration plants commissioned, uh, focused on, on technology that they've been working on up there, but quite similar to what we've been demonstrating. And it's been backed heavily by the dairy industry as, as being one of the sustainability plans of the future. So I'd like to see something like that happening in Ireland, um, a, a potentially a demonstration facility. Uh, that we actually have based here that people can see because I think it's so replicable that if you did have one successful model it could be something that could be replicated regionally across the country and when we talk about the bioeconomy you know grass is is such a key part of that from an Irish point of view so I think this could fit in very well um, so it's it's hard to know whether it'll be uh, industry-led maybe on the protein side whether it'll be farmer-led coming together is is still unclear at this point I do think when you look at um, the indus the protein industry side and the fact that uh, so much uh, uh, around imported soybean is coming under the spotlight over the last number of years you had Marks and Spencer's last year uh, putting plans in place to uh, reduce uh, um, imported soy for, for ingredients in their products coming in from, from Brazil. Uh, and, and there's been uh, other companies in the same position uh, over in the UK that I do think is going to come more and more under the spotlight. And this could potentially resolve a lot of challenges there. James, is there any move to do any research on the, on the beef side, even with suckler animals? Most of the work so far has been on the dairy side, both here in the Netherlands and in Denmark. I think it should happen, and I think th there's definitely, a, even though the projects have predominantly happened in the dairy sector so far, there's definitely a, an element where everyone involved feels that there's a role for beef farmers in this as well. Yeah, I, I think the beef farmers, they could produce um, the, um, the press cake that is unbuilt, and they can sell that to the dairy farmers. Then the dairy farmers do not need to make their own silage for the winter, and they could have more uh, cows per hectare uh, during the season. And that could help uh, both the beef farmers as the dairy farmers. Johan, what would you, you seem to have a pretty good global perspective on things. What do you think would be grown where the soy is currently grown in Brazil? Will they move to more grassland then and produce more beef? Or what would you think could happen in that situation? Oh no, um, soy is not just grown for the protein, but it is grown for the oil as well. And actually, the soy protein is a side product uh, from the oil industry. Therefore, the prices are low and it's difficult to compete with it. Uh, but as I said, with eight tons per hour, we, we think we can compete with the soy protein. Uh, also, because we have a higher concentration of protein in the, in the end product. Um, Brazilian soils, well, they have to be used for arable soil, uh, arable crops. Uh, like there are many of, of them. And another question for yourself, Johan, in, in relation to you quantified the amount of soy that's imported and that this process could replace that. Do we have enough grassland available across the EU to, to do that? Or have you quantified the grassland on a per country basis to... Yeah. In the European Union, there's about 100 million hectares of arable land, good land. Uh, of which about uh, one quarter is used for, um, for feed uh, with, with uh, grass. Um, There's about 70 million hectares of grassland in the European Union. Not all get enough water, uh, but there are some places where they get enough water. And certainly half of that 70 million hectares uh, is very good for this biorefinery purpose. We have a comment in here that somebody's already offering to work with you on the beef side. Um, so that's that's positive. Um, do we have time, Mark, to get a comment from the panelists in relation to wildlife? Just the impact of this process on it? You're yes, on yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we, we, we'll, uh, we have time for one more question. Just it, it, guys, if you'd like to comment on, on the impact of the process on wildlife or biodiversity and how it can play a role. Yeah. Um, well, it, it will have, um, uh, when you grow grass, it will not change it on the grassland itself. But in the uh, zero carbon project that we are now running, we have a lot of attention for biodiversity, having uh, hedges, uh, 
counting all the different uh, animals that we see, birds, worms, things like that. So that is on the micro level in, in the country itself. But if we do not need to deforestate um, forests in the rest of the world um, to get our uh, feet, uh, our feet and food, uh, that will have an enormous uh, benefit for keeping the um, biodiversity at high levels. I go to the um, to Uganda next next week. In 1950, they had five million people inhabitants. Now they have 40 million, and they hope to welcome a number 100 million in 2050. So a 20-fold increase in, um, in, uh, in a century, which means um, the country is not much bigger per uh, inhabitant than the Netherlands, that they will have serious problems to get their food and feed. So we have to work on a much, much better uh, economies for the use of, uh, of land, for the use of nitrogen. And otherwise, um, there will be enormous problems uh, with getting a lot of people, millions of people to Europe to get their food. Okay, there we must leave it. Um, Bridget, uh, James and Johan, thank you so much uh, for your presentations today. And uh, we, 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 I, I certainly really enjoyed. I mean, look, it's novel technology. Uh, it's 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 uh, it's something it, uh, we need to be looking at areas like this to uh, to reduce the the environmental footprint and to extract more value from what we're already producing from the land. So I think it's a fantastic example of of that. Um, so thanks again, and Porik, thanks very much for helping with the, the questions today. Um, just a reminder to everybody that um, we uh, today's session is recorded and will be available on the Chagas website. And next week we'll be speaking to Edward Burgess, who will be talking to us about fertilizer trends in Irish agriculture. Uh, just a reminder to say thank you to our series producer, Andy Boland, and Yvonne Maher and Pat Murphy. And uh, we'll see you all again next week at 9.30. So until next week, enjoy the, the long weekend and uh, we'll chat to you uh, next Friday. Thanks again. Bye. Thanks. Bye.